grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as you can tell, the altar this morning is covered in white pyramids. A depiction of an angel is on the your bulletin. Our hymns, our prayers, our readings, they all speak of angels, demons, and war. It is the feast of St. Michael and all of his angels. Let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. There is a lot we know, as well as a lot we don't know, about this distinct order of spiritual beings who inhabit the hidden world around us. For example, we don't know exactly when angels were created, but at some point in the process of creation, God made angels who must have been created simultaneously with no need to be fruitful and multiply like human beings. But how and when they were created, we don't know. Second, we don't know how many angels actually exist. The word often used to describe their number is myriad. That is the largest number that the ancients would have used. Nor do we know of what substance angelic beings consist. Our souls, of course, are housed in physical bodies, flesh and blood. Angels have no bodies, allowing them to operate differently. Although they may be seen at times in bodies and appear as men. What we do know is that angels are not soft. Angels are not effeminate. Nor do all angels have wings. And ladies, if I can just speak a word to you for a moment. I'm addressing you regarding when you go out and look for things, say, at Hobby Lobby to decorate your home with. Stop buying effeminate angels. You've seen them. Blonde hair, red fingernails. You don't have to throw away the ones you've already got. I know you've got them. I know. Don't throw those away just yet. Just stop buying effeminate looking angels. Look for manly angels. But you're probably not going to find those. The reason I say that is because they're fearful beings. When an angel interacts with a human being, the first thing they usually say is, fear not. Why? Because the person that they are encountering is coming apart at the seams to see something so majestic, to experience something so holy, so other. They're awesome beings, and awesome I'm using in the truest sense of the word means fearful. Now today, pizza is awesome, but angels are truly awesome. They're fearful. They're powerful spirits having both intellect and will, as we just got through singing, and they excel in strength. They're created to serve God by ministering to mankind, but they are not all-seeing, they are not all-knowing, they are not all-powerful as God is. Moreover, from what we can tell, the angels do this within a hierarchy. The first angel that we read of in our Bible is the one who guards Adam and Eve from eating the tree of life. For if they were to do so, this was an act of mercy, of course, barring Adam and Eve from eating of the tree of life. Because if they would have done so, after they had fallen into sin, they would have lived forever in that fallen state. So an angel is placed in the garden to guard them from coming back and from eating. The Bible calls this angel a cherubim. I know here in the South we say cherubim. Cherubim. That I-M ending on the end of a Hebrew word is plural. It makes it plural. Cherubim. This was a fearsome warrior. Really a protector of sorts. Adam and Eve didn't, didn't try to get into the garden. Let's just put it that way. They didn't say, Eve, you go that way and distract him while I go this. No. Don't 
Don't even go near it. And you know, this is why Luther rightly teaches in his morning and evening prayer that God would, here's the line and you know it, let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. What a wonderful, wonderful request made to God in the morning and before going to bed. Because angels are employed to promote the work of the church and to protect its servants. Other angels within this uh, hierarchy are called seraphim, not seraphim. The seraphim are the burning ones. That's the literal meaning, the burning ones. They're the ones, you recall, who cover their eyes, who cover their feet. They fly around the throne of the Lamb singing, holy, 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 get that. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. They don't say love, love, love. They don't say peace, peace, peace. They say holy, holy. One says holy, this one says holy. Just like in our intro, it, where the pastor chants and then you chant and then the pastor chants. Here's, here's one seraphim. He chants and then he chants and then the other chants. Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The seraphim stand in the undiminished glory of heaven and they are concerned with the holiness of God. Angels not only guard and protect, but they are worshipers. This is why much of what they say is something that we echo in the liturgy. Other angels are known for preaching. They're known for delivering messages to the Lord's people. The point is, at critical moments in God's dealing with mankind, you find angels delivering a message or explaining the, the moment to the persons who witness it. Now, there are a few angels who are named. Gabriel, as you know, the hero of God. He's one that we've heard of often. The Old Testament apocryphal book named Tobit has the name of an archangel by Raphael. This is actually one of the main characters in that book. And then, of course, there's Michael, whose name means one like God. Michael is called a chief angel, or what we call an archangel. Arch meaning first, superior to all the others. And this is why this day in the church year bears his name. But even then, Michael is second in command to our Lord. When we sing in the Sanctus, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. Sabaoth means Lord of the armies. The angelic armies. Or as in a King James Version of the Bible might say, Lord of hosts. Hosts means army. And so Michael serves the Lord, Lord God Sabaoth, not Sabbath, Sabaoth. He serves the Lord both day and night, defending his church from the evil one. So all angels were created holy. They're created righteous and good, like God. But sometime after their creation, as St. Jude tells us, some did not keep their proper domain, but rather left their own abode. Of course, led by Lucifer, which is his Latin name, Lucifer, the light bringer, who was originally a holy angel. Others defected with him. There was a rebellion in heaven, and these angels became sinful in their nature and in their work. As a result, they were condemned never to return to communion with God, and everlasting fire, therefore, was kindled just for them. So these fallen angels now are divided into two classes. There are those who are free, and there are those who are bound. They're reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you right now, I am not the brightest candle on the menorah, but it's those demons that are not bound, the ones that are free, those are the ones I'm most concerned about. 
They're the ones that the New Testament constantly reference, and they are the greatest danger that we face regarding the angelic realm. Those demons are they're cunning and they're deceitful. Even when quoting scripture, they're liars and they are murderers, utterly depraved, perverted, wicked, and unclean. And until the day of judgment, God permits them to roam the earth. And regarding the state, they are the driving force behind the wickedness of this world seeking to snuff out the light of the gospel, holding the heathen in abject idolatry and superstition. These evil angels are partially to blame for the wickedness that invades the home. As pornography and sexual sins and drugs and drunkenness take hold of the masses more and more and more. Some people, they're so foolish as to actually invite these demons into their homes and lives by practicing witchcraft. Opening up that door. Are you insane? Moreover, these devils plot to disturb and destroy the church by scattering heresies throughout hindering the work of faithful pastors by sowing discord and strife, tempting believers to turn away from the truth and against one another. The truth is we're surrounded by these evil creatures who seek to separate us from Christ and His church. Their constant goal is to bring violence and confusion and ultimately, to ultimately gobble us up like a snake with an egg. Against them, we don't have a chance. Now look, I get it. I get it. We are so limited by the here and now, by what we see, what we desire, and what we crave, that we can't even begin to comprehend the reality that lives in this unseen realm. We just got through confessing. God, who is the creator of all things, visible and invisible. What do you think is invisible? Angels. Angels. So ears, they don't hear them. Eyes, they can't see them. Angels can only be believed and received in faith. Boy, this is how God works, isn't it? God always hides Himself under weak and unimpressive things. For instance, God hides the majestic warfare of His holy angels under invisibility and silence. He hides His assault on the devil's kingdom under a little bit of water, a little bit of word, a little bit of wine, and unleavened bread. Really weak, unimpressive things. This is why so many do not believe. Because to the eyes of fallen man, to the ears of fallen women, all of that is foolishness. Sure, we may desire to look into angels, but angels, they actually desire to look into the gospel of Christ and Him crucified for you. For you see, it wasn't for the angels that Jesus left the right hand of God the Father Almighty and came into the visible realm, clothed in flesh and blood. It wasn't for angels He did that. It wasn't for the angels that Jesus went to the cross with His physical body and was crucified, died, and was buried, and rose on the third day. He didn't do that for angels. It wasn't for angels that Jesus gives you his very body and his blood to drink and to eat. All of that is not for the angels. It's for you. Why? Because in our epistle text we learn that there is a battle between the angels and the demons and Saint Michael, that great archangel who removes Satan from the heavenly council, doing so with the only weapons that can destroy the devil, which is the word of God and the blood of Jesus. 
the angels have conquered the devil with is exactly what we concern ourselves here this morning and every morning that we gather. The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The very same tools that St. Michael the Archangel used to boot the devil out of the counsel of God is exactly the tools that Jesus gives to you today. His word, his body, his blood. And though our eyes cannot see and our ears cannot hear, let us believe. For the day is coming when faith itself will come to an end. And with our glorified eyes, we will see. And with our glorified ears, we will hear angels and archangels and all the company of heaven singing, blessing, honor, glory, and power be to Him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Rise for the